The Dr. Oba Tashaka Show. Free your mind and the rest will follow. A show for all who are on the journey to discover the truths about their identity, history, culture, politics, spirituality, and family relationships. This is a show for the Black Freedom Movement and the Black Power Generation and the hip hop generation, including Black Lives Matter and associate activists, all of whom are seeking change. Dr. Obatashaka and his guests are dropping knowledge and insight from his successful organizing, research, writings, and innovative thoughts, the best of which have piped into God's mind to lift you up higher and higher. To the bosses, OGs, rappers, influencers, and those looking to evolve from the constraints of misinformation and miseducation to build a foundation for personal growth, love, and mental freedom. Check out the wisdom of the OR. Yeah, that's the original revolutionary, Oba T who inspired a million black men with his rousing speech at the Million Man March and who continues to fight, write, and speak the truth. Dr. Oba Tashaka is one of the deepest deep thinkers in the world today. A quote by Dr. Asa Hilliard. Dr. Oba Tashaka, then Bill Bradley, was the best leader organizer in the Congress of Racial Equality an endorsement from Dr. George Wiley, Associate Director of National Corps and the best organizer blacks produced in the 1970s as the organizer of the National Welfare Rights Organization. The Dr. Oba Tashaka Show. Free your mind and the rest will follow. Good morning. Greetings um, to uh, the early viewers and those that will come on uh, to the Dr. Obatashaka show. Um, greetings to Brother Ogawa, Sister Robin, Stephen McKenzie, Ty 13. Um, greetings to all of you and others who uh, will come on um, as the show develops. Um, I want to thank uh, all the viewers coming from different spaces, some of whom have been former students of mine, uh, some of whom uh, were children in the Black community when we were organizing at different periods, and some contacted me through uh, the Malcolm X Unity House, Pan-African People's Organization, a group that still operates. Um, to all the new viewers who have come on and uh, viewers in the UK that I've been working with for uh, since 1974 um, and viewers around the world. So uh, greetings to all of you. And I want to thank everyone for the interest. I, I get, keep getting people coming up to me saying, I watched the show. And some of them say, I'm watching all of them. It sounds like Brother Ugawa. <laughs> I'm, I'm digesting it. You know, I'm saying, oh, really? You know? Uh, so, you know, I want to thank people for their interest. Um, I want to thank Brother Ugawa for the really good work he's been doing um, in building the viewership, uh, especially Twitter, and um, it's really showing up. And I want to thank the rest of you who uh, have an interest and who have brought in your consciousness. And I know bringing other people in to the show, and I hope that it's useful in your life because the whole purpose of this show is to empower you to draw on your own inner powers. Also want to thank all those who have made donations to the show. Um, it's helping me to um, pay for uh, some of the 
recruitment efforts that we're starting to make on a more professional level to draw in subscribers. Last week's show was a rerun of my second show uh, dealing with um, the presidential election of 2020. And it was a projection of how it would go. And it went the way that I projected it. And uh, my filmmaker, Lo Rojan, uh, did the uh, film clips. It's uh, a very important show. And uh, you should check it out because you've got another set of midterm elections coming up and then others in two years. And for those of you who think you have no power or you think that power is only absolute, you're either in control and running everything or you're out of control. Actually, power is exercised every minute you breathe. And um, we exercise power um, in this country often beyond what we realize. And so that show uh, did a uh, look at the two post-Reconstruction periods, 1876 and 1968, with a backdrop on the first Reconstruction of 1865 and the second one of 1955. And it was showing you basically how Trump was going to lose. I projected it. And it went just the way it was projected, you know. And um, you all put Trump out of the White House. It seems like there are a lot of forces in this country that don't want to stick them in the jailhouse. But um, if they don't, then you're going to have to whip them another way. But it's an illustration of our power. The reason that I did the rerun is that me and my wife, Pamela Hurley Tashaka, the light of my life, um, we took a drive down to Monterey, California, uh, for those of you that don't know, that's an area about 200 miles from uh, the Bay Area. It's right on the Pacific Ocean. And we spent a week there. We went Monday and uh, we have a, a motel that we have that's right on the ocean. And it's about as pristine as the ocean gets in the United States. I have to say that because it doesn't compare to the pristine nature of Caribbean oceans, at least those that haven't been polluted. And that's most of them. And so I just laid back and um, enjoyed the ocean and just cooled out. And so did my wife. And then we attended the 65th uh, Monterey Jazz Festival. This is the oldest uh, jazz festival in the United States. People come from all over the world and uh, the United States uh, to this festival. And we stayed in a place called Pacific Grove, which is in between Monterey and Carmel. And it's a little heavenly enclave. And so it was really enjoyable. Um, and at the Monterey Jazz Festival, because you know, I'm into new African and African culture. The Monterey Jazz Festival, there were some highlights. Uh, there was a group called Ranky Tanky, R-A-N-K-Y-T-A-N-K-Y. It's a Gullah Geechee band. Now, Smalls and I, you know, we did a thing on the Gullah Geechee stuff uh, two weeks ago. Now, uh, something very special uh, came out of this group. And one of the singers, the lead singer, noted it. And it was the singing of a woman uh, named Duana, D-U-I-A-N-A, -A, Parter, P-A-R-T-E-R. -E she had a sound like no sound I've ever heard. And it, I call it waves of sound. It's kind of like the waves of the ocean the way her voice um, was expressed. It was just heavenly, never heard a sound like this. And then there was Chuck uh, Chuco Valdez, um, who led 
what he called his Yoruba Land Orchestra. And um, this was magnificent because it was jazz um, with a strong uh, Yoruba bass with the drummers getting central stage. The Yoruba drummers and then uh, the regular drummers that you use in uh, jazz and in other uh, music. But the uh, regular drummers played like African drummers. It was absolutely beautiful. And uh, Chuko Valdez uh, put together a composition that was just seamless African and new African with the blues bass, uh, with uh, a strong African bass. It was just powerful. And then um, another feature, uh, which was a draw for people who attended the conference, was Joshua Redman, uh, who is a uh, saxophone player and of the younger generation. He's probably in his 50s now. And uh, uh, a Yale graduate, very brilliant, but I have to make a comment on this. Um, he's a sign of a problem that um, if it infects the world and is infecting jazz uh, to an extent. And it's the mechanization of the music. And while he's an excellent composer, excellent musician, um, he knows the saxophone inside out. He knows the history of jazz and all of that. And a brilliant young man. He went to Yale and, um, you know, could have done a whole lot of things other than music. He's going with his passion. His father was a great musician. But the problem is uh, he plays mechanically. And this is largely the result of being trained in jazz music schools not being trained under the apprenticeship of masters. I'm not saying he's had no master influences, but I'm saying that that hasn't been his primary schooling. And so most of his music had a mechanical quality to it and uh, was, was not, with the exception of his last song, which was drawn from the blues, didn't have feeling. And... Um, his music as a whole, I would say, doesn't have originality. And that's a component of what's happening in jazz because, and it's happening across the board uh, because of being infected by the Aryan approach. And even though uh, jazz music schools are teaching jazz, they're teaching it in a European format, the lecture format, the intellectual format, learning the music, but not the soul format and not the oral format and not the apprenticeship format. Though some who are teaching in jazz music schools combine apprenticeship uh, with um, what's happening in the classroom. And even then it's a compromise. And we've always had uh, some jazz musicians, John Handy, who was on my show uh, a month or so ago. John Handy has formal training and he's also apprenticed, but he's coming out of um, a learning process where he was learning in his community at a very young age. As he said in the show, you can't really uh, know jazz unless you learn it at a very young age. And that means it's got to be in you. Um, so um, that's a comment, you know, and it's a comment that if you're going to have a system, uh, whatever it is, and in this particular case, the music of jazz, the various systems, your, your teaching methodology is going to affect your playing. And if your teaching methodology is Western, you're playing, even though you'll be playing the jazz, you know, music, and sometimes you'll even be playing some jazz masters, the goal in jazz is to be your own master. And to do that, you've got to come out and draw from your soul 
your own unique voice. And that only occurs under apprenticeship, director indirect, and drawing from masters. I see Brother Shabazz here makes a comment. He says, I don't know much about jazz. A brother put me on Joshua Redmond back in the late 90s when I was in the Marine Corps and stationed in Hawaii. If I recall correctly, they were both from the Bay Area. Yeah, in the Marine Corps. Huh? So was I in my brainwash day, except mine was in the reserves. Yeah, so I, I'm not knocking Joshua Redmond. I'm just simply saying that that's a commentary on the impact that the Aryan view is having on us. And, and when it affects your art form and the highest peak, and it doesn't affect all of it, but to the degree that it does, then it throws it off course. And it may explain why there have been few, if any, innovative masters since the period of Coltrane and Miles Davis and others, because innovation is the realm where you pipe into God um, and where you draw from your creative juices, as Miles said, where you start with what you know, and then, as he said, rise above yourself. <laughs> he had lost, nearly lost his voice. So rising above yourself is where it's at. Um, Two weeks ago, Professor James Smalls and I uh, had a conversation on African-American spirituality. So um, this is an extension of that. And um, what's, what's also uh, encouraging is that conversation has generated uh, over 2,400 views. Um, on Facebook and Instagram, over a thousand views, excuse me, on YouTube, over a thousand views on YouTube and over 1400 on Facebook. And that's because uh, the two of us, that was part of it. But to say it was because of Smalls, that was part of it. But we had Smalls on a year ago and he didn't draw that. In fact, he drew just about what we were drawing on other shows. And Smalls is someone very popular on YouTube and Facebook on the internet. So I think the main reason that we had that draw was the topic, but also uh, it was because uh, we've been building the show. We've been building the platform. So more, more people know about the show and can spread it. And uh, so, th so I, I wanna say that uh, that's important and it's due to all of you who have been supporting this show. Um, so this show today is gonna be an extension of um, the show two weeks ago. Um, the show two weeks ago focused primarily on African spirituality as it continued in the US. And that was an expression of African culture. And James Smalls coming from South Carolina could talk about the whaling bench and spirit possession and a lot of other qualities. We talked about secret societies and other things, uh, which have been the primary transmitter of uh, mastery systems, particularly during slavery and coming out of it. Uh, so today uh, I'm gonna be focusing on the African conception of God, focusing on the Dogon conception of God. And particularly uh, looking at God's role in um, creating multiple universes or multiple cosmoses. In most cases, when uh, this discussion occurs, we just talk about the cosmos, which would be the Milky Way, which is the neighborhood uh, that we live in uh, on Earth. But as this new um, telescope that's been put up indicates, this is one of many photographs coming from this new telescope that a brother managed and another brother created the lens for these are photographs of multiple cosmoses. And 
going back millions of years um, or billions. So this is a bigger discussion of just our neighborhood because God created everything. Hmm? And so um, I'm going to focus on the Dogon conception of God, and I'm linking that to the Dogon conception of God's role in creating the cosmos, which means God creating the cosmos. And why would I choose the Dogon? Well, because it's the first system that I've drawn on and it shaped me, but also because in this, within this context, they are the masters of astrophysics. And as the masters of astrophysics, they exceed even the Chemites in astrophysics. This is the opinion of many, including Dr. Finch, who I want to give special credit to for his great work, The Star of Deep Beginnings, um, which reconciles um, African astrophysics, particularly Dogon, with modern day astrophysics. And astrophysics is just simply the physics of the stellar realm, the physics of stars. <laughs> huh? And as you've noted in previous shows that I've done, we're all miniature stars. We're composed of the elements, all the elements that make up the stars. That's what we are. And if you noted the uh, series that I did with my sister, Sandrea Bradley, on astrology, that and, and by the way, the Dogon astrophysicists are all astrologers. And as I pointed out in one of the shows, astrology has its origin in Kemet, um, where, according to Herodotus, who gets quoted on everything else, but our scholars seem to want to leave this out because they have the same problem as some of my viewers have. They're spooked out on astrology. Well, if you're miniature stars, don't you think you want to know how this works within you? See, this whole saying we have, we're the miniature universe within the larger universe, that's true, but that's a theory. Do you know how it works? And see, I'm a, a philosopher, and so I'm dealing with philosophy today, but African philosophy is spirit-based. European philosophy is despiritualized. It's intellectual. And when they deal with a, a field like astronomy, it is stripped of any spirit core. So it's separate from astrology. Right now, I'm doing a life review because um, I'm um, at 63 years of work on my, my destiny, my ka, and I'm doing breakthrough work right now. This book that's coming out on Seba is a replacement system. Uh, for teaching on many different levels and for mastery. And I've now reached a conclusion that now completes the circle for an explanation for the basis of world history, which you're not going to hear anything about in terms of what's completed the circle until I'm nearly completing it. And that's a breakthrough that I've just made. And so I'm now doing an assessment of where I'm at spiritually. And that's in astrology, that's looking at my transits. I'm looking at Saturn, Neptune, Pluto, um, Uranus, the heavy planets. And those pretty much time um, your movement through life. And they're cyclical. Saturn has a rotation of 29 and a half years. And so uh, when you're close to 60, you're in the ending of the second cycle. That has meaning. And so right now, I'm assessing um, where I'm at. And it beats in, in, in fact, this ain't psychological work. The psychologist um, Freud took the spirit out of psychology. Carl Jung didn't. But Freud did, and he's had the greater influence on Western psychology. And most of us have been despiritualized as Afrocentric people because we're just into facts and information. 
and an intellectual discourse. But as I pointed out before, in African thought, to know the truth, you have to be the truth. And the thing about astrology is it's arm of astrophysics that applies, that is astronomy, that applies to the human being because Herodotus noted that the Chemites invented astrology and according to the time, date, year, and place of birth, they could determine a person's destiny, the course of their life, and when they would die. Now, none of us today, or I don't know any that know how to predict death. And if we could, we wouldn't want to tell anybody. I, I'm not interested in knowing that. That's one of the great mysteries that will just have to unfold. But life is slow dying. We're dying every day. And that's a part of living. you know. But then again, that's an African perspective. So this discussion that I'm going to launch today on the nature of God and God's role in creating the universe, which God created, um, you'd better understand this. You would have a better understanding of this if you understood how your own God force works within you. And I know many of us do in that we're intuitive, we have psychic experiences, or we have dreams, or you know, various things. And so that's a big part of it. But this is the master system for knowing how your rotational field works. We're all miniature universes rotating in this larger universe. Right now, it's Earth, but it's really well beyond Earth. And that's something that our ancestors understood much better uh, than we do. Uh, so this is going to focus on the Dogon conception of God within the context of the creation of the stellar universe, within the context of astrophysics. Again, why the Dogon? The Dogon, and who are the Dogon? The Dogon are a people of Mali, M-A-L-I, and they come out of the Malian Empire founded by Sundiata Kiata, or Sunjata Kiata. Sunjata, son of buffalo woman. Kiata, uh, son of lion king. He was born of a hunchback, ugly African woman who it was prophesied that Sunjata's father would marry and would give birth to Sunjata Kiata, one of the greatest sons in the constellation of nations. And he would give birth to the great Malian empire, which happened. The Dogon are a people of the Malian Empire who did not want to convert to Islam. And so when Sunjata takes on um, this role as a liberator and then the founder of the Malian Empire, he is normally considered to be a Muslim. But many uh, Malians will tell you that Sunjata was not a Muslim or that he was a nominal Muslim. But whatever, um, the people who became Dogon did not want to give up their traditional spirit system. And so they migrated 1,400 years ago uh, from the heart of the Malian Empire um, to an inhospitable area called the Bangadiria Cliffs, B-A-N-G-A-D-I-A-G-A-R-A, Bangadiria Cliffs. And so literally, they live uh, in, the, in, in these cliffs. And that was to protect them both against the wars coming from Islam and later slavery. And so they maintain their traditional system by living in an inhospitable uh, environment. So um, there... They developed a very original form of astrophysics, the study of stellar phenomenon. 
some of this definitely does have a connection to Kemet because you'll see some symbols in uh, their astronomical system that you will find in the Kemetic, but uh, Kemet is not the source for the origin of their astrophysics. They originated it themselves after displacing the Twa who lived in the Bangadaria cliff. And these Twa were probably Anu people that had moved out of Kemet. Um, so every people's conception of God is in many ways tied to their conception of themselves. Let's deal with the immediate one that you're familiar with, the Aryan or European one. Their conception of God, and I'm reading, uh, going back over the holy book of the uh, uh, people of India, the Gita, um, and um, <clears throat> in the holy book, one of the things they say, and, and by the way, this is a book put together by Aryans who conquered India, but who took over uh, the Dalit, or what was then called the Dravidian spirit system that you'd call religion, which there's no word for it in any African language. And basically they're describing a system um, that uh, is based heavily on spirit ideas. So it's a very some very heavy stuff but they've dropped into it the Aryan thought. And so one of the things that they drop into it is when they talk about, because they call uh, the, uh, their spirit beliefs a religion. And they say, and this is their conception of their role, which is in part a description of the Aryan, but their con conception of God, they say that the Aryans' religion tells him to conquer the world. <laughs> this is their idea. And so when you open the Gita, it's a discussion of uh, their God, who's black, by the way, but whose message is not black, is not African, you know, Lord Krishna. And Krishna is telling his most loyal follower, because this is a story cast in heaven, why he needs to wage war against his own family and kill his own family members. <laughs> and basically, he's using African logic to justify an Aryan concept. The Aryan concept is to be lord and master and to conquer. But the uh, message that he's giving um, his, his lead general is that you must wage war against your own family and kill many of them because Krishna commands it, basically. And uh, he also says to justify it, he uses African logic, but Africans would never use this to justify what he's justifying, killing your own family. But he says, um, you must do this because I order it, but also because in doing it, you're not really killing the person because the soul is eternal. So he's using knowledge coming from Africans, spirit knowledge, to justify conquest. So this conception of God, um, Lord Krishna, who's black, is whitened by the Aryan impulse. So the way they saw God was through their ethos as Lord and masters. And that's pretty much how Westerners have used Christianity uh, for conquest purposes, using the Old Testament as the basis. Now, Here's a comment from Thai 313. I've heard the Hindu caste system is based on the religion what was made by the Aryans with Brahmin priests at the top and Sita slaves and untouchables at the bottom. No, the caste system was a system created by Africans and these were um, 
the uh, Dravidians originally. Uh, they prefer to be called Dalits now. That's a group that's been reduced to the lowest level below slavery of untouchability. When the Aryan comes in and conquers India, they come in as warriors without women. Um, they come alone they, for conquest. Once they conquer, they take on the caste system that Africans had already established. East Africans have these caste systems. Kemet had a caste system, you know, but it wasn't frozen. But this caste system was an occupational system. At the highest was Brahmin. Below that was Kasitra, Kasitra's warriors. Below that were farmers. Below that were slaves. But the slaves didn't have the misery that they had uh, once the um, Aryans conquered. So what the Aryan does is take over the caste system and after learning it from the Africans, dominate the Brahmin caste, which is the priestly caste, the top. And of course, their drive is warriors. And so, but what they add to it is the notion of what caste means. It meant occupation. But under them, because the Aryan comes in with this notion of being lord and master, but they also come in with a negative view of those that are different. And this is the earliest expression of racism. Varna uh, is the term that they uh, create for caste, and it means color. And so the lowest caste, the untouchables, are blacks. They live in southern India. That's where you have the highest respect for women. In fact, the only respect, because the Aryan has no respect for women. Highest level of civilization. So that's, that's the basis for that. Um, and of course, with the Western Aryan, uh, they are coming from a slightly different standpoint. If you're dealing with the Greeks or the Romans or others, a slightly different context. They're not uh, coming out of the caste system of the Aryans because uh, India is a different place than uh, Western Europe or the Mediterranean. But they all share the notion of being lords and masters. And their concept of God is one of lord and mastery. So biblically, uh, the Western view is that God gave man, not man and woman, man, lordship over nature and lordship over women. And this is part of what's bringing global climate disaster because it supports an Aryan view of control, in this case, control of nature. So Western um, views uh, of God are an expression of themselves. <laughs> it's, it's more than just God is white or black, because God ain't neither. God's a force. Now, my experience with God that I've shared with you before is the beautiful light, and um, that is confirmed by people whose um, spiritual powers are very high, including Fool's Crow, I've discussed this before, a great Lakota holy man. And he's gone to the highest heaven. There are many heavens. And the highest heaven is the heaven of the lights. And he's seen God. And God is a beautiful light, a beautiful white light. And there are many other lights in this realm, the highest realm of heaven. And they are lights governing different forces, the green light of nature, the blue light of the sky and others. And so um, this is my understanding of God. And my understanding of God is that that light resides, a spark of it within each of us. It's a spark that is infinitely small. And that's the soul that resides in everything God has created. It has a soul, you know? Now, in the Greek conception, the, the one that's most popular is Pl Plato's conception of the form, F-O-R-M. And this is an idea that he received from Socrates, his teacher. 
And Socrates said, um, the soul in the pre-existing state in heaven was able to view forms. Now, um, for Plato, what this meant was that um, there were truths that are eternal, such as beauty, such as justice, such as truth, that these are forms and that these forms are the highest realm, higher than God. And uh, each form is separate from the other. And this, there's a lot. And, and the highest form is the good. And the only way forms could be understood was through reason, despiritualized reason. You know. Now, what Plato got, he distorted. Um, Plato's idea, which came from Socrates, actually comes from what the Dogon would call a dunoso, A-D-U-N-O, a dunoso. A duno, I've discussed this in uh, a previous show, a duno means universe. So means spoken word. So together, a dunoso, spoken word of the universe. A dunoso uh, in the Dogon system is their way of conveying knowledge. And knowledge is conveyed through table of signs. A dunoso are table of signs drawn in the sand, drawn in the earth. And um, they're conveyors of knowledge. Particularly, a dunoso conveys God's thoughts. And in Dogon um, systems, God is called Amma, A-M-M-A, similar to Amun, A-M-M-O-N. But in terms of the Dogon conception of God, very original and um, very profound. And so a Dunoso is conveying God's mind. That's what this is. Now, some of us will like to equate this to the symbol. But it is more profound than the symbol because the symbol is something that represents something else. But a dunoso is a miniature of God's creation. This is one of my conclusions that I've reached before in working in the Dogon system that I've worked with uh, now for probably 50, 55 years, is that uh, every teaching in the Dogon system, or what the West would call symbols, but the Dogon call a dunoso, what characterizes them is that within any symbol or dunoso is the whole system. That's what characterizes that. So as I've said before, this is my formulation. Some of my students who took my class on Dogon philosophy got this. This was my conclusion. After working on this for many, many years, you could take any part of the system, and in that part is the whole of the system. So I say within anything is everything. So God's mind is a whole mind. My experience with the light is that the truths that God conveyed to me through the light were whole truths of a part. None of us get the whole. Only God has the whole. Einstein was looking for it. He was wasting his time. He couldn't handle it if he got it. You know what I mean? It's impossible. So um, the Dogon teach this way, and it is orally taught. This is also why the mastery system um, is uh, traced on the ground, but it is taught orally, you know? And uh, even though we give birth to writing, writing imitates speech in African systems. So in looking at the Dogon conception of God um, and God's creation of multiple universes, it's important to understand that when conveying 
this knowledge. The Dogon do it through degrees that I've talked about before, four degrees of knowledge that require transformation, that require a person to become more in harmony with the cosmos. But it is conveyed through whole knowledge, not partial knowledge. So when I was talking about Joshua Redman and jazz, the problem is when you get this intellectual training as your exclusive training for how to play music, you can only play in one way, intellectually. You don't get the emotion. You don't get the intuition. You don't get the higher mind. And, and you don't get to how to mix things up. You know what I mean? Huh. And so as a result, you're not going to move anybody because you're not doing it God's way, which is holistic. And of course, in the African system, to do that, you have to be whatever it is that you are learning. And so to really be a master musician, then you've got to be those truths. That's why a Coltrane could take the music to the level of a love supreme. So I'm introducing you a little bit to the Dogon, a conception of God. The Babar conception of God is, as I've explained before, infinite force outside of space and outside of time. And that is certainly true. What I'm going to, as I just briefly survey each African conception of God, just very briefly, I'm going to say they're all consistent. <clears throat> they're all just giving you uh, different dimensions of God. None of them are wrong. You know? So... The Bambara are saying that God is infinite force outside of space and outside of time. And that's consistent with the Chua conception of um, this idea that God is um, the infinite forces, a part of which is distributed to each entity that God creates. So a spark of God is in everything. And that's why ancient people not only Africans, but people of color regarded uh, every part of nature as sacred because it's God. This picture here of the multiple universes, that's God. Huh. Huh. It's a manifestation of God because God's a great light. But these notes are all lights of different colors. And those colors have different vibratory forces, you know? So this is a profound definition. And by the way, it's perfectly consistent with astrophysics and quantum physics and Dogon conceptions of God. The Yoruba conception of God, uh, and by the way, the Bambara call God Ma Ngala, M-A-A-N-G-A-L-A. Ma, which is the term, for a human being, Ngala, God. That's their term for God. Notice M-A-A -A minus T, Ma'at. The Yoruba uh, call God Oludumari, Oludumari. And while there's much to all of these concepts, I'm just hitting on the top here. Their concept of God is the one with the superlative character the one who's free of blemish. This is a very profound concept, which is again an expression of Yoruba culture in that and, and of African culture in general, that the goal in life is to be a good human being, to be godlike, if you can. And none of us are, but we should try to be. And so again, this is consistent. Uh, with these other ideas of God. And then the Kemites, they have the notion that the first state of existence wasn't God, it was the noon, N-U-N, the watery mass. It's not water, but it's like water. And then God comes out of this mass. Now, this is particularly um, to be expected of a people who are surrounded by water, the Nile Valley. But also, it's got truth in that the human being is basically water. Um, 
75% or so. The Earth's surface is water. And you're looking at these hurricanes now, and you're seeing what's happening when you wage war against nature, as mad Western science has done. And so uh, man and woman's friend and all of nature's friend, water, is, is now rearing its head up along with wind and other forces of nature. So, so their idea that even before God appears on the scene, water, the watery mass is there. But the key thing about the watery mass is it's made up of energy, a vital force. And God comes out of that. The African-American conception of God that we were talking about last week, note that it's consistent with Bambara thought in that Many of our enslaved ancestors lived outside of time. They lived in the realm of spirit a great deal of the time. And this gave them solace, but it also gave them insight because they were living in the mind of God. And so it could be in the midst of cotton picking, you know, God is visiting them in various forms. And that's because they carried Africa into their reality. So the African-American conception of God uh, expressed in hush harbors where you're possessed by the spirit is, again, the vital force, experiencing it. That's the essence of it. Now, all of these notions are consistent. They're just bringing out different dimensions of God. And uh, when you add them all together, then you've got something really profound, but each one is profound within itself. Um, so what's the Dogon conception of God? And what is the Dogon conception of God's relationship to the cosmos? Now, if you want to know God, and particularly on this realm especially, but God, period, you need to know the God within you, the light within you. The song that we have in the spirituals, this little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. You know what I mean? Huh. That was no just some beautiful song, this was the conception of who we are. So what does the name Amma, A-M-M-A, -M -M -A, mean? It means, listen to this, to hold firmly, to hold firmly, to embrace strongly, and keep in the same place. Let me say this again. Amma means to hold firmly, to embrace strongly, and keep in the same place. What this is saying is, the Dogon is saying that God is unicity. God is oneness. And in, consistent with this idea of God is a great white light, God is in one place in this highest heaven, radiating the vital force for everything. You hear me? And distributing it apart to everything that God creates. This is the concept of God. So it means that everyone is held by God. Everyone is embraced by God. A tree is. An ant is. Everything that God creates is. And God is able to do this by staying in one place, by holding this force, by exchanging this force, and by creating uh, through this force. In this case, creating multiple universes. Ama is also, it, the term itself, is space. Hear this. God's outside of space and outside of time, but when 
creation occurs, God is space. And it is almost infinite. And God, or the term Ama, means to preserve or provide safekeeping for all things. God is the place of safety. And as I've experienced it, unconditional love, great peace. Ultimate wisdom, great kindness, good beyond all our conceptions of good, God. Free of all fault, as the Europeans say, free of all blemishes. And this is what the human being should aspire for. Of course, if you're on the Aryan track, not hardly. So in the Dogon system, um, there are systems of four degrees of knowledge, Jiriso, G-I-R-I-S-O, forward knowledge, knowledge in front of you. Beniso, B-E-N-N-E-S-O, the side word, peripheral knowledge, but simple. And then Boloso, knowledge behind you more complex, learn through synthesis. On these three levels, the Dogon convey profound, profound uh, cosmic truth through a symbol. When you go through these first three degrees, you will not know what it means. The symbol is digitaria exilis, D-I-G-I-T-A-R-I-A, D-I-G-I, T-A-R-I-A, exilis, E-X-I-L-I-S, digitary exilis. It's a cereal grain. Remember the Dogon are agriculturalists. And in the Dogon, first three degrees of knowledge, the, um, there are eight ancestors. These eight ancestors are uh, beings who uh, do God's work on earth. And the last of these ancestors, the eighth, receives the smallest of small cereal grains. So small that you can barely see it. And he's upset because eight is also the number for life. And so uh, the eighth in number is symbolic of life itself or creation. And so here is the eighth ancestor receiving the smallest of cereal grains. And those who are coming before this eighth ancestor are receiving larger ones. He's even jealous. You know, why God give me this small cereal grain? But in the Dogon um, system, um, the first three degrees convey knowledge without referring directly to astrophysics. Astrophysics is implied in the way things move. Um, in their rotational activity, the way knowledge is conveyed. It's, it's implied, but it's not directly stated. And so it's only when you get to Sodaya, S-O-D-S-O-D-A-Y-I, which it takes years to get to, and I'm giving you a speck of knowledge here, but don't think you can jump into Sodaya because it's a question of transformation and being these truths and molding, molding and remolding yourself to be these truths uh, that you can get to this level. And um, in the Dogon system, as I've explained before, there are Sodaya masters, Hogans, H-O-G-A-N, uh, who are uh, priests, who are masters of all of this, but there are very few. In most cases, the Hogans are masters of a part of these truths. So dia meaning the Dogon system in its ordered complexity. So when you get to so dia, what you discover is that digitaria exilis is symbolic of what 
And so Dia is called the Po, P-O. And the Po um, is centered in Amma's womb. So symbolically in uh, Dunoso, when the Dogon are explaining the creation of the universe, they are explaining that the universe is created out of God. And so everything in the universe has a godlike quality. So their Adunaso uh, way of conveying this is to say, created out of God's womb. Now we know God is not human. So this is symbol, Adunaso. And there are many things that are going on in this. I'm only going to focus on this one thing. And so um, in the womb, W-O-M-B, of Amma, um, is digitary exilus, which in Sodaya is the Po, P-O. And it is centered in God's womb, or Amma's egg. And it is this little thing that is the origin of matter. And so when we're looking at this cosmos, this vast, I shouldn't say cosmos, these cosmoses, this vastness arises from the infinitely small, from the Po. Now the Po, according to the Dogon, is Sirius B, a dwarf star. Among the smallest of stars. A draw star is a dying star, but that star is the one out of which new stars are born. And so in Dogon astrophysics, it's the vibration that is occurring within the Po that's called digitary exilus in the smaller system that gives rise to everything. It is the source of everything. So modern astrophysics has taken a long time to catch up with this wisdom that the Dogon already have. And it is concluded that as the Dogon already had, that quote, in the structure and behavior of the smallest things lies the explanation of all matter. So when we're talking about Amma, who is no thing but everything, who is a spark of light within the human being, and then of many other lights, because there's the ka, there's the ba, there are many other qualities that this human being has and that other forces that God creates, because everything that's matter is spirit, ultimately. That all of them derive from this infinitely small, and so when happening begins to happen, to use a comedic expression, it happens when this Po seed vibrates. And the Dogon put it this way because this is consistent with their philosophy. Um, they say the vibration inside the Po, inside this seed, is a vibration that occurs seven times. And then at the seventh, at the eighth, it breaks out. Seven is a symbol of four, the masculine, and three, the feminine. And so the Dogon is saying that the cosmos is based on twinness. And so for the Dogon, um, Sirius B, which is the source for the cosmos, has a companion star, Imenya who is the female star, Sirius B being the male star. But we know that from astrophysics, the universe comes into being through what modern astrophysicists call the Big Bang and what the Dogon call the Big Burst. The vast cosmoses come out of the infinitely small. Now, Dr. Finch, in his great work, The Star of Deep Beginnings, um, he draws this conclusion. The internal movement of the smallest of all the element 
God created is reflected in space by the spiraling motion of the stars coming out of the Po. That's his interpretation. So the Po or Sirius B reflects the origin of space time because there's a time before that, which is singularity. I won't get into that today. You know? Now, isn't it interesting that when it comes to humanity, who are the first human beings that bring civilization and wisdom to the planet, bring goodness and truth to the planet, who live ma'at, masore, M-A-A-S-O-U-R-I, the root of ma'at, the smallest of small people, the twa, mirroring the role of Sirius B or the dwarf star. And their burst is to bring from heaven the purity of God to earth and establish human civilization. Go back and watch the series on the Twa and also the series on the Anu. I created a whole new school of history. And this is the baby that I'm really getting ready to work on. You know, the whole baby. Remember, my goal is to take the best of your past and apply it right now so you can live it so that you can know the truth to be the truth. You hear me? This is beautiful stuff. And for me, the Dogon were my first teachers when it comes to African thought. The spiritual blues, <laughs> my grounding in new African culture, these two are harmonious and extensions of each other. And this is work that I'm constantly doing. And being an astrologer, this helped. And then going through the life transformation process, I've explained to you <clears throat> of being a hard-headed warrior who knew the tough side, but not the soft side. You know what I mean? I had to be softened up by life kicking my behind, going on retreats for um, three months a year for five years, 15 months. Look at it myself. That led to the mother principle, to the beautiful light. But I owe a lot to the Dogon and to new African culture and to my people, to everyday black folks that woke this sleeping black man up. So <laughs> think about it. When you look at the stars, when you look at the sky, when you look at the moon, and especially the full moon, but the moon, when you look at everything God created, you're looking at God in its manifested form, coming out of this big burst that gave life to the cosmos. And so now, don't, don't put down what's little. Uh, the most profound stuff is simple. What God gave me through piping into God's mind, um, the formula for just societies, all the males and females being equally empowered to govern every phase of society, describing how twa societies work. That's your key to transforming unjust to just. This is more profound than anything Marx ever had. And I don't knock Marx in that he was trying to equitably distribute wealth. Unfortunately, he didn't break himself away from the Aryan view. And so that, that system just hasn't been able to take off. <clears throat> People proclaim themselves that, the Chinese, the Russians, the Cubans. Uh, but manifesting it has been a problem. Because hmm. you need the paradigm, the model. So... Today's presentation was on the Dogon conception of God 
in God's creation of multiple universes. And all of those are within you. This is my point. I have no motive on this show. I'm, I freed myself of organizations. I belong to a lot of different groups. I don't, I, though I'm chair of Pan-African People's Organization, the others I'm not a part of. I'm putting myself in the training mode to help out the younger generation and to draw from anyone that's got wisdom to learn from you, you know? So my motive is just to empower you. You know, this is, this is my thing. And it gets you to understand your power. And this here is spirit power. <laughs> huh? Beautiful stuff. And I know many of you draw on that power. And hopefully you draw deeper. So I hope you got something out of this. Hotep. And let's see if there's uh, any comments or questions. See, this is where um, I get to learn something. <clears throat> if you have something to share or if you have questions. So thank you, Alicia. Love you too. You know what I mean? That's what drives me is love, baby. You hear me? Hmm? Love of my people, love of humanity, love of God. Um, and, and I especially want to say, I'm sharing this with my people and anyone else that wants to learn and all of my people, but especially you young folks because you got a task in front of you, you know? So let's see if you got any comments or questions here. I appreciate oh, Brother Ogawa posting certain comments here. Uh, Damien Bland, um, what is one of the best spiritual books you've read to reach God? Hmm. I don't think that there are any books that have been the best for reaching God, you know, but the systems, the Dogon system has been uh, very good. Um, I would say that it's, that it's been the path to learning the path of falling in the pit and learning some mother wit, you know, that's been the path and seeing where I was inadequate and then seeing the need to work on those weaknesses. So to see, as I've explained before on this show, to see that um, for all of these successes I was having as a warrior, that um, I was weak on a side that, and, and prevented me from seeing things that were going on right around me, problems with my first wife. And so that's what led me on the path. So I don't think that there is a particular spiritual book for me, though there, there are many. And so I would say being an astrologer has helped because it's helped me to understand where I am on my cosmic journey at different points. So that's been one. And the Dogon system um, for providing a system of mastery and particularly realigning my thought pattern, the Dogon system, and then other African systems that I've drawn from, including African-American. And I'll always say this, that the African system only works in conjunction with the African-American because um, you have to apply this to your reality. And that's true with the sixfold stages to mental freedom uh, that was a key part of the path, you know, which once we have 40 and a few more people have signed up, that'll be a webinar for a year, uh, twice a month for a year. Um, and that's what got me grounded in knowing myself, respecting and loving myself at a deeper level. Uh, so all of those help prepare uh, for that. And then all of this, um, helping me to become more aligned with the cosmos. Part of that came when I was in um, 
Tanzania, working in the Ujamaa villages in 1973, three months, Pan-African People's Organization. We brought 10 people, everybody paid their way, and we worked in these villages. I lost 15 pounds, I've explained before, doing this work. Well, one of the things I noticed, I've mentioned this way back in one of the earlier shows, I noticed that when, because we were living uh, very often on concrete or whatever, you know, and wherever we're sleeping, a bug comes in or a snake or something else. And I noticed how the Africans handled it. They would pick it up and just take it out, not kill it. And so that immediately alerted me to how westernized I was, even though I could quote all this African stuff. And it led me to have a deeper respect for nature and not want to spray things and kill things. And when I saw some little bug in trouble, help the bug out, not step on it, you know? So, um, yeah, that's, that's kind of that. Dennis Boatwright, Dr. John Henry Clark, Spirit is Alive. Definitely. Okay. Okay, let's see if there's anything on the bottom here. Ty313, Baba, what do you think us Gen Z, Generation Z role is in the politics right now? Um, your role is you better appreciate what's at stake right now because what's happening is we're in a transition period where whites are going down. Numerically in this country, There'll be a minority by 2044, 2045. So they're doing everything they can to stall it and to maintain their power. I was listening to a show on C-SPAN last night, um, and uh, the daughter of uh, a friend of mine who was in CORE uh, was speaking, uh, George Wiley, his daughter, um, ran for mayor. And she was making some points about the moves that are being made to strip a lot of blacks, people of color and youth of the right to vote. And she was talking about in Georgia, 235,000 blacks have been removed from the rolls. And they're doing this in different parts of the country. And she was critical of the Democratic Party for not raising this. They're, they're talking about in, in the past when this happened, because this has happened before, um, prior to Obama uh, being elected president, <clears throat> they said they couldn't deal with this because it was too close to the election. It would confuse people. No, they ain't dealing with it because they think, oh, this just affects blacks. Not realizing that we are the balance of power. And if you take enough, enough of us out and we lose, you're going to lose because what your generation, uh, Generation Z, as you call it, uh, is facing is the rise of crypto fascism, meaning it's not full fascism where they just take over and everything's shut down. You can't speak, you can't assemble anything like that, but it's elements of it. And had Trump been reelected, you're going to see that full blown, but a lot of the youth don't get it. So you need to be, as the youth, um, your role in politics is to get involved in community organizing. Find a group or create a group in your community that is doing something to empower our people economically, politically, socially. Um, and that's what this show is designed to help people with. And without that, Trump would be in office. Black Lives Matter played that role, a bunch of networks of groups. And a lot of us just treat that like it's nothing. You know what I mean? So 
the, the first politics is the grassroots at the grassroots level. And then electoral politics, you need to use it uh, particularly like, for example, the, this midterm election, very important. So they, they're stacking the deck. They got all kinds of people out there who have been elected to office who are election deniers, who are claiming that Trump was you know, cheated out of the White House. And some of them are playing a role in counting votes and stuff, you know? So you're gonna have to overwhelm that because the only way they win with that kind of strategy is in a close election. Then they can tilt it. But if it's overwhelming, they can't. That's why Obama won two times. He knew that. And so all of you youth, you all have to play a role in that too. You know what I mean? And at the local level and statewide level, that's really important. And by the way, take note of everything that's happening around you. I was listening to the show last night again on C-SPAN, and a huge number of federal judges have been appointed by Biden, more than Trump appointed in his first two years. Federal judges are more important than the Supreme Court because most decisions are made at the federal level when it comes to that level of decisions. So um, a significant number of sisters have been appointed to federal judgeships. Now you can say, yeah, so what? So what? It might be a so what that makes a difference depending on who's making a decision at a certain time. See, I'm a revolutionary. I'm about changing society, but I also deal with the real right now. You know what I mean? And some people think that revolution is only about the final stage when you take a system out and replace it with another. That may be who knows when. What are you doing to prepare for that? So community organizing is key. Electoral politics is key. Um, and, you know, just dealing with, with your needs for like right now. You got the problem of low marriage rates among young people and um, among our people in general. Marriage rate now is 29% among black males and females. You know, if you're going to push that up, you're going to deal with economic development. Both empowering our people through seeing that they get better jobs, raising the skill level of the average brother or sister so that they can make more money, um, and building uh, an economy, which we have, but it's generally owned by one person and generally not capital rich because the banks won't provide financing. By the way, I'm good at economic development. Among the revolutionaries, I'm the only one. And among the nationalists, they're generally broke. I think broke's a joke. You hear me? Broke's a joke. I put $25,000 of my money into this show. I'm not continuing to do it. That's why I'm, I'm asking people to make contributions because if I have to continue to finance it, I won't do it because broke is not a joke. I'm not going broke on this show. <laughs> huh? So uh, make your contributions. It's, it's right there on the bottom. And subscribe to the show and get other people to subscribe to the show. So there's a lot of stuff your generation needs to do. And I think the biggest one is keeping your eyes open, um, opening your eyes up. And, and as uh, Brother Ogawa is schooling me on, this 20-year this 20 year old generation, especially this, y'all, your eyes are opening up. So draw on whatever you can to do that, you know? Um, Ty313, do you think it's the time for another radicalized generation? Yeah, hell yeah. <laughs> I'm a revolutionary. <laughs> what do you think I'm going to say? No? Yes. Uh, now, circumstances play a role in radicalizing you. So that's why you've had some movements come up. Your generation, basically your coming of age politically, the hip hop generation, this younger generation, and those a little bit older in their 30s and 40s and 50s, your, your real coming of age um, occurs with the Michael Brown situation, you know? And, you know, the, the whole movement against police violence, that's key. That's key. Because up to that time, it wasn't really clear 
whether this generation was going to find its voice. That's your voice. It's a big voice. And it's a, it's a sporadic voice because people get angry only at certain times and then rise up and explode. So that's playing the role that the voter rights thing and segregation played in the 60s. The difference being segregation was an outmoded system. So it was going to go out sooner or later. We pushed it out. But the police, they should be outmoded, but they keep in the police. At the local level, there's a lot of fights going on among blacks and their allies, people of color and others, against uh, the police and cutting police budgets and stuff. And at the local level, some things are being done. But overall, that's a difficult agenda. So that as the youth address police violence, you got to address economics, you got to address jobs, you got to address rebuilding families, you got to address revitalizing our communities. There's a whole lot of other things that have to happen and you have to do it smart. I never lost a battle. My stuff's smart. There are groups that we've had on this show I didn't join because I saw where it was going. I'm a strategist. And I could see that where they were going, yeah, they're going to get some recognition and stuff, and then a lot of them are going to end up dead, and this, this ain't smart. I don't do dumb. Do smart. <laughs> Strategy is the ultimate art. You know what I mean? So there's a lot that you have to do, your generation. The respect of young brothers for sisters and sisters for brothers, that is something that has to be worked on. You know what I mean? A lot of stuff. Prison industrial complex, breaking that down. A lot of stuff, you know. Yeah, you need a radicalized generation, but it's based on the issues that face you now. And I would say the overall framework for understanding that, read my book, The Integration Trap, Generation Gap, caused by a choice between two cultures. That provides the overall framework. You can get that on Gumroad. That comes under the framework of a choice between two cultures. Those are God's words, piping into God's mind. For this generation to address the issues that face you, you have a choice between two cultures. Whatever you do politically, economically, socially, or otherwise, community organizing or otherwise, Either you ground it in the best of African and African-American culture, or you're going to find yourself going the other way. And if you go the other way, then uh, that is going to not do us any good. And so you need to read this book, The Integration Trap, Generation Gap, Caused by a Choice Between Two Cultures, because it's giving you the framework out of which um, you have to deal. Because the forces that hit us since... 1968, the forces of drugs, deindustrialization, counterintelligence program, knocking off our leaders and so forth, many other forces, redevelopment, breaking up communities and so forth, had an unintended consequence. Whites were not smart enough to figure this out. The unintended consequences was a choice between two cultures. And when you're seeing some blacks up here supporting Trump, now that is really a dumb choice between two cultures, you know? Um, NJX0077, where can we learn about what seeds the other seven Dogon ancestors received? Uh, the best book is read the book Conversations with Ogo Tameli. Conversations with Ogo Tameli. O G O T O M M E L L I. Ogo Tameli. That's the introduction to uh, the first three degrees of knowledge. So that's a good one. Um, and there's a book called African Worlds. Um, you can check that out. It's kind of like a summary of uh, these systems. Um, 
good book on astrology. Well, see, astrology is a method. It's a system. So it's a system for learning uh, how to do this. I would suggest that you contact my sister, Sandrea Bradley, who's, uh, when you click in to the show under the screen, when you go to the screen, you'll see her address. Click into her. We're both astrologers, but I don't do any training on this, and she trains people in this. And a few people uh, who watched the previous shows we did on astrology um, started with her. So there's basic, basically to learn astrology, you're basically learning how to read a chart, which is uh, the person's ka or destiny. And so it's a system. So it's a very bunch of different things you have to learn. So um, the introductory texts are basically introductory texts on how to uh, set up and interpret a chart. And uh, that's the angular relationship of planets in a person's life based on the time of their birth. And that's what really astrology is. It's not just the sun sign. It's the way in which the sun relates to Jupiter or Jupiter relates to Saturn and so forth. The angular relationship, which is astronomy. Astrology is astronomy because what you're using is the table of astronomy of the motion of the planets. And then you're looking at uh, how they rotate inside of you. And so there's two levels of astrology. One level is the basic chart, and that's the birth chart, the person's born. And that's the placement of planets. So that's like the basic personality of a person or potential, because astrology doesn't dictate anything. Everything is about choice, free will. Uh, it shows your potential and what you do with your potential. So that's one level. That's always important because that's the basic you. And then there's what, what I was talking about. I'm doing my checkup now, transits. That's the movement of the slow-moving planets, Saturn, Uranus, Pluto, Jupiter. Um, those planets... Because they're slow moving, they have a, a bigger effect on you over a longer period of time. And so uh, it's learning how to translate that, you know. And then astrology does not tell you a person's level of spiritual development. Astrology does not tell you a person's culture. Those are things that... Uh, are developed within the person. And so those are separate. Of course, you have to know those, you know, but those are separate. Could the Poe also refer to an atom? That's a good question. In the sense that the atom is a miniature universe, yes, because uh, the atom... Is, is like the solar system. It's a miniature solar system. And um, the Po is, is like the source for all of it, you know? Tai 313, uh, the family of seeds starts with the Po to which is interesting. Okay. Alicia, October is Hoodoo Heritage Month. <laughs> Do you find any connection between African Americans' Hoodoo tradition and the Twa, Dogon, Kemites, and other spiritual traditions? Yeah, Hoodoo is a part of Voodoo, you know. Um, there's a song um, that one of my favorite singers sang where he talks about how the Hoodoo woman Hoodoo the Voodoo man. <laughs> Hoodoo is kind of the, the spirit power contained in, in various things, potions, protective charms, and various things that come out of voodoo. And all of that comes out of Africa. And that's what the black church is founded on and rest heavily on to this day. Spirit, baby, you know, and the white church doesn't.
Uh, Ku O One Tai Three Thousand. Hotep, my brother, you used to come to Merritt College back when I was in college. You presented us with some great lectures. Okay, thank you, brother. Yeah, uh, Sister Arrington was the first chair of Merritt Black Studies. Dr. Siri Brown took her place. Um, yeah, Dr. Arrington and Dr. Brown, great people. And I have Dr. Arrington's painting that she had of, um, of a pharaoh. It's too large for her house. She lived right down the hill from me until she moved to Sacramento, passed away recently, but a beautiful sister. You know. <clears throat> uh, Brother Ogawa has put up um, the title for the book, Conversations with Ogo Tameli. NJX 0077. Yes, within anything is everything. Yeah, that's true. And so that you know, you got to develop the whole mind. So the more you combine your intuitive spirit powers with this reasoning force, which is basic, and you shouldn't do anything that doesn't make sense. That's reasoning. You know what I mean? Anyone wants you to do stupid, don't do it. You know what I mean? <laughs> but when it comes to higher stuff, um, then that's another thing. And there's a question here that I prefer to answer at another time. Okay, that's it. Hotep, I hope you all got something out of this. And um, encourage your friends, associates to subscribe. Um and um, make a donation to the show. There's Ty 313. Baba, any books or anything I could find on job creation for our community or just past examples of way our people use? Go look at my first show. Um, I think it's Free the Mind, where I lay down how the San Francisco Freedom Movement accomplished this, produced jobs for our people. The only successful freedom or black power movement from 63 to now, the only one. And, I'm, and my next book is going to be on that. So go look at that. Because basically, you've got a task of seeing that a lot of youth um, get their skills upgraded, number one. But number two, have some opportunity to have some legitimate work or the cash so they can accumulate it to set up their own business. And so I've talked about... Um, the moves, the successful moves that some blacks have made in Amazon, uni, un, unionizing Amazon. Christian Smalls, the young brother who led that on the East Coast. You need more of that. But go look at the shows that I've done, particularly that. There's another one if you look at uh, the, the shows uh, for the various shows that this show has produced. You'll see one with Angela Davis's picture. Click into that. That's a presentation that I made to the San Francisco Public Library in 2014 on the San Francisco Freedom Movement. And that has, along with the first show, a lot of uh, um, film backup. My cinematographer put in a lot of backup in that. So there's an explanation of how that movement worked. This is the most important thing because while addressing the police issue is important, putting food on your table is most important. You know? Okay. And um, any books? I would say just read up on past movements. Um, read up on SNCC, Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. Read up on CORE, Congress of Racial Equality. Read up on Ella Baker, uh, who was the mother of group-centered leadership. Read up on Malcolm. Read up on Garvey. Read up on the various organizations that have done some good work on the Nation of Islam. Re you know, read. Read on the Black Panther Party. Read. You know, there are a bunch of, bunch of things. And um, those who put... Trump out of the White House, they had done their reading. There's a level of your generation, they're a little older, they're in their 50s, 
who are really conscious, they've done some serious reading. <clears throat> and some of your younger people are as well. But go in depth. You can't do surface, you know, and look at strengths and weaknesses. And you can't reproduce a movement that occurred before. You've got to be able to uh, deal with the current conditions that you're facing right now. But draw from the best lessons from your past to help you do that. You know what I mean? And remember, there's a lot of different ways to skin a cat. Get creative. The good thing about your enemy is that they're used to what's happened before. When you come up and wage an organizing campaign, it's got to be creative. It's got to come at angles that they don't expect, you know, and it can win. Tie 13, yes, that's my problem. Our problem's a bit different. Yeah, so read the integration trap. Choice between two cultures, brother, that's the big difference. Big difference. Okay, Hotep. I enjoyed this. I hope you got something out of it. Until next week.